Unemployment rates. Unemployment. Catastrophe of unemployment. Unemployment. Fear of unemployment. Unemployment. Something we hear a lot about. Unemployment rate. Unemployment rate. Unemployment rate. Unemployment rate. It's in the news. Politicians are always talking about it. Unemployment rate. Unemployment rate. Unemployment. Unemployment rate. Unemployment. Unemployment rate. Basically, whenever we talk about the economy, unemployment is a part of the conversation. But it seems kind of simple, right? Like, isn't it just a measure of how many people can't find jobs? So why have I decided to make an entire video about it? Well, because behind this definition, there is something much bigger going on, something that teaches us about the inner workings of the economy. Unemployment remains a serious problem. Unemployment is where the cold, rational mechanics of economics meets the aspirations and disappointments of millions of people. And it shows us how our capitalistic system can succeed and fail in allocating the most important of its resources, its people. Unemployment. 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 The unemployment rate. Unemployment. It's okay, I got options. Unemployment. Financial crisis. Let's go. So we hear this word economy all the time, but what exactly is an economy? Think of the economy as a set of rules, relationships, and patterns that help huge groups of people that don't know each other somehow peacefully coordinate with one another. All of this with the aim of allocating scarce resources in an efficient way that theoretically should benefit everyone. We all live and participate in an economy that somehow mostly works. Somehow, all of us billions of people manage to coordinate with each other, to produce, to innovate, to push the productive boundaries of society forward. But none of this complex coordination would be possible without one key ingredient. It's the number that you see everywhere you go. This key ingredient is prices. For seven ninety nine, bigger, bigger. One with each dollar ninety nine here. Nine twenty for five ninety nine only at KFC. Prices are not just prices. <laughs> like it's not just the number to be like, you know, that's how much it costs. Prices are like telephone wires in the economy. They're like the lighthouse that sends out a signal to make the whole thing work. Anyone who didn't study economics is like, wait. It's just prices. Why, why are you calling it a lighthouse? When I was studying econ, this prices are a signal thing was really hard to get my head around. But I now understand that prices are the glue of the economy, the mechanism through which the market organizes itself so that millions of people can make billions of decisions in a harmonious way. To see what I mean, and to figure out what this has to do with unemployment, which is why you clicked on this video, let's go back to the neighborhood that helped us understand what a recession is in our last econ video that we make. Yes, I make macroeconomic videos now because the people seem to like it and I seem to like it. So we're all happy. And let's once again focus on baguettes because I like French bread and I lament the fact that my country doesn't have enough of it. I have a baguette over there too. Do you? Yeah, I bought one very coincidentally. You have a baguette in this, in this studio right now? Yeah, it's in my kitchen. <sighs> Not only do you have animation, you have a real baguette that I may nibble on throughout this video. <laughs> Okay, let's go to the neighborhood. Okay, so we're in this neighborhood and baguettes are actually becoming a cool thing. They're trending. Everyone's talking about baguettes. And this one bakery is pumping out delicious artisan baguettes for your neighborhood. These baguettes are like $3 a piece, which is a nice affordable price. More and more people are showing up to buy them. But the bakery has a problem. They only have capacity to make 20 baguettes per day. But because baguettes are trending, 30 people want to buy baguettes at $3 a piece. So what does the baker do to fix this? I know, says the baker, let's raise prices. The baker realizes that because of all this demand, they can raise prices from $3 to $4. And that's exactly what he does. And boom, they just sent out a signal to the entire neighborhood. Baguettes are trending in the neighborhood. The baker thinks that people are willing to pay $4. Of the 30 people who were in line to buy the baguettes back when they were $3, 10 of them shake their head. They're like, no way, Jose, $4 is way too spendy for a baguette. These 10 neighbors either can't afford or are not willing to pay four bucks for a baguette. But look, 20 of them are either fancy rich people or just really love baguettes. And they're willing to stay in that line to pay four bucks for their baguettes. Oh, and look, remember that the baker is only able to make exactly 20 baguettes to meet the 20 baguettes demanded by the people who are willing to pay $4. Prices did that. I mean, in reality, the baker didn't raise prices just so that he could create a nice equilibrium between supply and demand. He did it because he saw an opportunity to make more money. But in the process, he found a price that matched his 20 baguettes to 20 people who were willing to buy them. Nothing goes to waste, everyone is happy, and the invisible hand has done its work. 
Thank you, Adam Smith. Now, inevitably, some entrepreneur is gonna show up and be like, oh, there's a profit-making opportunity in this neighborhood. They're gonna open a bakery, and now the bakery is making like 50 baguettes and competing with the other bakery, and both these bakeries will eventually have to lower their prices so that more people can get in on these baguettes so they can get rid of all their baguettes, and baguettes eventually will stabilize to $2.50 or three bucks. And now the prices have been stabilized. Thank you, competition for keeping prices low. My point in talking over supply and demand here is so that when you see the little price tag on like a box of cereal in the grocery store, just know that this isn't the company just throwing out a random number. That number, in a sense, has been decided for the company by the magic of the economy that pushes prices to be just where they need to be to connect all the stuff available to the number of people who are willing to pay for it. There's all sorts of caveats to this. Prices can sometimes create really bad outcomes for people. What I'm trying to convey here is that prices are the language that businesses use to communicate with consumers, a signal that conveys information and makes it possible for billions of people to organize and trade with each other. Thank you, prices. Thank you, market. Speaking of prices and markets, I'm a small business owner and you might be too. And so I'm gonna take a moment to thank our sponsor, which is stamps.com, a company I've been using for years to run my small business. For years, I would go to the post office, which is something I really don't like to do. It's a very inefficient place. I finally actually was watching an ad like this and clicked the link somewhere and signed up for stamps.com and it changed my world. I'm, I'm saying this very authentically. Stamps.com allows you to print your own postage and shipping labels from your office. Oh, but how are we supposed to know how heavy the package is because that affects the postage? Check this out. In our office, we have one. They give you a scale. You have a scale, you measure it, it goes right into your computer, and now you're printing your shipping label. And it comes with a discount on postage from USPS. So it's cheaper and it's very easy and quick to set up. There's a reason why stamps.com has been around for 25 years, helping small businesses solve the pain point of shipping things. There's a link in my description, stamps.com slash Johnny Harris. Clicking that link helps support this channel, but it also gets you in on one month of free stamps.com, a trial where you can try this out. You also get free postage and a free scale. Like they'll send you the scale. Again, I got in on on this deal from like another YouTuber a few years ago and I haven't gone back. Thank you stamps.com for sponsoring today's video, supporting this channel. Let's get back to unemployment. The market works because of prices. Okay, so what happens when you apply the same market logic, not just to baguettes and cereal, but to the most important resource of all, the people. In economics, we call the people labor. We are all just labor. And instead of prices, we call it wages, like how much you get paid for your labor. But the dynamic is really similar. When companies in an economy need workers with certain skills, they go shopping for labor by posting a job and deciding how much they are willing to pay for that job in the form of wages. Okay, so now we're in a market. And once again, prices or wages help match up jobs demanded by the job hunters with jobs supplied by the companies looking for labor. If a company has a lot of money or really needs workers, they can offer a high wage. Like back in our neighborhood where baguettes are trending and the baker is making great profits and they need help making more baguettes who is willing to pay really well, and he quickly attracts people with the right skills and the job is filled. Prices, or wages, have once again served as a great matchmaker in the economy. And thanks to this labor market dynamic, more high quality baguettes will be produced with the energy and talent of different people. The productive frontiers of the economy are pushed forward. People have jobs, the economy is growing. Okay, wait, let's just look at real life for a second. I love the animated world, it's beautiful, but like the labor market works in real life and it's kind of nuts. Like, have you ever wondered how on earth you can walk into like a pharmacy and there will be people behind the counter who have exactly the special training needed to be there? Not just in one pharmacy, but in every pharmacy in your city, every pharmacy in the country, all of these people were somehow physically distributed throughout the whole country to meet the demand for pharmacists. In order for these pharmacists to end up at all of these different pharmacies, they had to spend years studying and training, and then they had to take the job and potentially move to a new place to start working there. And no one overtly told them to do this. Like years ago, they decided they wanted to study to be a pharmacist. And then they eventually graduated and they found a job and maybe they had to move across the country. And that's one person's journey. Now times that by every pharmacist in every pharmacy. And now times that by every architect and doctor and engineer and x-ray technician and molecular biologist and speech pathologist and school teacher and police officer and somehow human beings are being distributed like baguettes. How on earth does that happen? It's thanks to markets and prices and that's the moral of the story. 
Humans are basically like baguettes who get allocated throughout the economy based on price signals allowing for a perfect pairing of people and jobs, and not a single person can't find a job. Womp, womp, womp. Not so fast, free market. Free market economics does miraculously work quite well to get people paired up with jobs all over this country and world. But no, people are not baguettes. They can't just be quickly allocated around based on the economy's needs. Sometimes the market fails us. And when it does, we have unemployment. You had about 6 million people in the country unemployed. Now you have 12 million people in the country unemployed. People are complex. We have different talents, dreams, aspirations, and the jobs we take are some of the biggest decisions of our lives. There are way more factors at play than just how much the job pays. The vastness of human experience doesn't always coordinate perfectly with the immediate needs of a market, which only cares about efficiently allocating a scarce resource. And this gets to one really important version of unemployment. Economists call this natural unemployment. It's an acknowledgement that even in the best of times, there will always be certain job seekers who aren't working because they had to go back and get certain training, or they have skills that are no no longer super relevant to the economy, so they have to pivot. Or, in a lot of cases, they aren't willing to move across the country far away from family to take a job that pays well, but maybe doesn't align with their values or whatever. Meaning it happens because humans are just being complex humans, making important decisions. And the result is that some portion of the population will not be able to find a job. Productive resources of the economy sit idle, and we have unemployment. Natural unemployment. Here's what the US natural employment over the last 70 years has looked like. It sort of hovers between 4 to 7%, which means that at any given point, somewhere between 6 and 7 million people want a job but can't find one just cuz. Because the economy is always changing and the skills that are needed are always changing and humans are complicated and not baguettes and finding new jobs is a big deal. That's natural unemployment. And it's the one that you never hear about. No one cares about it. It is natural. It is a part of our economy we kind of forget about it. The type of unemployment that we talk about a lot is the one I'm about to talk about. But first, I have to mention two things that don't get measured in any of this. First is the fact that sometimes you have a situation where pharmacists can't find a job because there's no jobs available. All the pharmacies have the pharmacists they need. So now you've got this pharmacist who's like teaching tennis because they can't find a job for what they were trained in. This is called underemployment. And it's really hard to measure. And quickly, the other thing is that when we measure employment, all of these graphs, we're only measuring work that makes money for the economy. There are millions of people in the US doing unpaid but highly economically valuable work, mostly caring for people. I'm talking about parents. So anyway, underemployment and not paying caretakers is a whole other topic and I can make a whole video about that. Let's get to the unemployment that we always hear about. In the USA, another 2.4 million people have filed for unemployment benefits in the past week. More than 38 million people have now lost their jobs. The unemployment that news anchors and politicians freak out about looks like this. Unemployment numbers are rising. This is the worst crisis they've faced. Shock and panic is of the worst layoffs the country has seen since the Great Depression. This is called cyclical unemployment. And it's a part of that mysterious pattern that we talked about in the recession video, where seemingly, inevitably, and unpredictably, shocks come blowing through our economy every few years, throw off the nice balance that markets are supposed to trend towards. Demand in your industry falls, your company can no longer afford to pay you, you get fired, you're freaked out, and without a paycheck, you're not able to spend money, which means that the other companies are losing revenue and they have to lay off their people, and the cycle continues and continues. The housing market collapse created one financial crisis after another. This is cyclical unemployment. This cycle is at the heart of why recessions happen. It's like a dangerous avalanche of capitalist economies. And because we workers are treated like baguettes put into a market where there's supply and demand, we get hit by this too. But remember that the worst thing that can happen to a baguette is that it will sit unsold and uneaten on this shelf getting stale. I mean, you can make some good croutons out of those. I'm not, I'm not complaining. But humans aren't baguettes. When humans are an unused resource in an economy, that means suffering and misery and anxiety and worry. You didn't do anything wrong. You got your training, you got your job, you followed your dreams, the economy even allocated you to a good fit, but now suddenly you're out of work because everyone around you is losing income. The GDP line is going down. And like I explained in the recession video, when this line goes down in a capitalist economy, bad things happen.
And there's a certain paradox to all of this. An economy in a recession is an economy starving of new talent, new output. And yet during these spikes, when we're in recession, all of the people that could be contributing to it are sitting idle, unable to find a job in a system that failed them and failed to coordinate in the worst way possible. Ultimately, economies exist to help people prosper. So when an economy produces all of this misery, it's really failing. Which is why in a lot of countries, the government has tools to step in and help, both to reduce the suffering, but also to ensure that this cycle doesn't gain momentum and turn the whole thing into an anxiety-ridden chaos, which, whether we want to think so or not, is an option here. Economies do collapse because there is momentum when all of this anxiety starts to spread and people stop spending money and people keep losing their jobs. Governments often have to step in and help pump the brakes. So even during the good times, the government will step in and support unemployed people. And during the bad times, unemployment becomes especially vital for keeping the economy from collapsing. I mean, we saw this during COVID. Unemployment skyrocketed and the government had to scramble to send us all money so that we would keep spending even if we just got fired from our jobs. In Europe and Japan and Korea, they did it a little bit differently. They actually paid the employers to just not fire people. Either way, the government did this not only to alleviate the immediate suffering of the people who were losing their jobs, but also to avoid the vicious cycle. Unveiled a nearly $2 trillion COVID-19 relief plan on Thursday, urging lawmakers to act fast and jumpstart an economy pummeled by the pandemic. The upshot here is that unemployment is both complicated and incredibly high stakes. It's unpredictable. We can't really stop it, or at least we haven't figured out how to yet. Not only because it deals with complicated human lives that have a capacity for suffering, but also because at the end of the day, we humans aren't just participants in the economy. We are the economy in a very real sense. Our mass psychology dictates how this all plays out. And because we are all tied into this together, no single one of us has total control over our own situation, which is an incredibly scary thing to think about, so don't think about it too much. It's a sort of Faustian bargain that we've made. And for most of us, it's worth it. Incredible opportunity for prosperity in exchange for surrendering some control of our situation. So we do this as one giant connected group, working hard to coordinate with each other using the language language of prices and wages, with the hope of procuring and providing resources for ourselves and our family. And this is why politicians and the news talk about unemployment all the time. It's because our jobs are not baguettes. Our work is a huge part of our lives, and yet they are not guaranteed. So supporting jobs, job security, job well-being, and solid employment truly is one of the most important things a government can and should do for its people. Okay, done. Sweet. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna be a chaotic man for a second. Okay, so, whoa, hi. Whew, unemployment, hope you understand more about that topic. Ah. Moral of the story is that humans aren't baguettes. That's all I was trying to say, okay? Doesn't mean baguettes aren't special. Hold on, let me finish eating this baguette. I hope everyone's liking these uh, macroeconomics explainers. There's so many topics here that are kind of gatekept by, by economists who like to make them really complicated. They're not that complicated. Like we can all understand what this stuff is. And yeah, I just, I just like the idea of having like a, a whole library of macroeconomic concepts that we can explain. Anyway, um, thanks for watching today's video. And um, thanks to the supporters over at the newsroom, which is our Patreon, who support our videos, support our studio, support all the people behind the scenes. We make an extra video for our patrons every single month. And uh, it's a behind the scenes vlog of how we do what we do here on um, this YouTube channel that has now grown into dozens of people who help make it possible. That, that's why we're able to publish every week. Not because of me, <laughs> I'm one part of it, but uh, we have a really cool talented team of people who help make this possible. So that's the newsroom. We also sell LUTs and presets, which help you color your videos and photos. I publish my videos a week early over on Nebula. You can see the link in my description for that. And lastly, if there is an economic principle or idea or thing that you hear a lot about and want me to explain and unpack, just let me know. I am more than happy to keep this up. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for watching here until the very end of this video. Like we're in the last moments here and you are still watching, which I really appreciate. So um, I guess I'll see you with the next one, which is probably gonna be soon. Or if you go to Nebula, you could watch it literally right now, but see ya.